Hello and welcome everyone to our first PL Entres All Hands of the Year. Um, we are a little overdue. It's in February, um, but we're excited to share all of the new new things that have been happening in Endres land. Here's our agenda. We're going to start with our, our update. We have a lot of good spotlights for you. And then we have two deep dives on all of the awesome cost optimizations that have been happening um, to our various different Web2 infra that we use to power things and the results of the December Nat hole punching month. Um, so excited to make time for those. Um, as a reminder, the PL Endres Working Group is part of the PL Network, where we drive breakthroughs in computing technology to push humanity forward. Um, we think that the internet is one of humanity's greatest superpowers, and that building an awesome, solid, reliable foundation for humanity's information is um, super critical to do now, and now especially because there's so many breakthroughs coming. We're already seeing how fast AI can take over the world, um, and we want to make sure that these are built on solid foundations foundations that are robust to all sorts of, um, you know, issues, uh, centralized control, um, um, and other, other problems like that. We have the pleasure of working on a ton of amazing projects um, that are open source and uh, being part of these open source communities and ecosystems. Um, we especially spend a chunk of our time on IPFS, libp2p, and Filecoin, but there are many other um, protocols uh, and, and uh, networks um, that we spend a chunk of time on as well and contribute towards and help flourish. Um, and so we're, we're always seeing and, and helping support more uh, get started in the PL network as well. Um, our mission is to scale and unlock new breakthroughs for IPFS, Falcon, LibDB, and related protocols. Um, we do that by helping drive new breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability, scaling the great collaborative open network native research and development that happens across the PL network, um, and also helping steward and grow our open source projects, networks, and communities um, to, to new heights. We have a whole chunk of different teams within the PL Andres Working Group, um, and you can get in touch with all of those in our public notion. Um, and this is our strategy for 2023. Um, so shouldn't shouldn't be that familiar, or should be pretty familiar for folks who saw it in, in December, but new and updated for this year. Um, our base, base layer is keeping critical system stewardship and growth. Um, we want to be growing because if you are static, um, you are dead. And so we need to make sure that the amazing open source communities we contribute to are always on a solid growth trajectory. Um, we also look at the overall contribution and teams that are contributing towards these projects um, and supporting um, many groups to come in and, and build and scale and launch new applications and businesses that collaborate and increase uh, kind of total net value created here. And then we have kind of our two, two big bets for 2023 that look very familiar. Um, one is robust storage and retrieval across IPFS and Filecoin, scaling our data onboarding and scaling our retrievals um, at CDN speeds with lots of adoption from Lighthouse users who we can shine shine the Lighthouse on um, to show the, the value they are getting from IPFS and Filecoin. Um, and then second, compute over Filecoin state and data, um, upgrading Filecoin with lots of new L2 capabilities, um, helping scale the chain space for all of those capabilities, um, and then also bringing compute to the data in Filecoin. So lots of stuff there. Um, Diving into the robust storage and retrieval. Um, this is our storage and retrieval lifecycle. If you saw the Endra Summit, should be pretty familiar, um, where we have storage clients who are storing data with storage providers, who then you know interface with retrieval pro providers and retrieval clients. Um, and really, our focus um, in this quarter in particular is really around um, making sure that the retrieval part of that lifecycle works and works well. Um, and so there's actually a very uh, exciting project called Rhea, uh, which is focused on robust retrievals, um, collaborating between the IPFS gateway and Saturn and uh, Boost and Network Indexer um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the underlying uh, components and modules from a data transport perspective across um, IPFS and Falcon as well um, to make sure that this storage and retrieval lifecycle is getting connected smoothly and that we complete that circle so that the data stored by, say, Filecoin SPs um, is accessible uh, on IPFS gateway um, clients using Saturn for those fast lookups. 
also helps us support um, all of the amazing growth happening in Saturn land and bootstrapping that business. Um, and it helps us with our cost cutting efforts to actually reduce the costs that we're sending to folks like AWS and Equinix, and instead get to reroute those funds and resources to all of our um, you know, Web3 powered uh, Saturn nodes uh, in our distributed retrieval market. So um, lots of great work happening there. Big thanks to Bedrock, Saturn, IPFS, Bifrost, and a number of other teams for pushing that forward. Um, our two kind of, well, we have a couple of big initiatives in, in this uh, second area. Uh, first of them is FEM, which is um, unlocking a whole ton of new things like storage provider, DeFi, loans and staking, um, programmable storage that can lead to perpetual long-term, you know, you know, infinitely long-term um, maybe uh, deals into the future. And then just a huge plethora of um, different projects um, that builders are making um, through various hackathons. So lots of new uh, capabilities coming there. Uh, but another thing that folks are uh, building on top of FEM is also that computation over data and the ability to have layer twos that can, um, you know, harness that the L1 of uh, Falcoin and Falcoin's um, kind of programmable state to then spawn additional networks that are um, optimized for um, new capabilities. And so um, some new capabilities we're very excited about are bringing large scale compute over Falcoin data. This is all the great work that the Bakal Yao team is doing. Um, there's also lots of opportunity for more compute networks to come and build on top of those reusable open source components to build bespoke compute networks that are optimizing for different points in Juan's Triangle. And then there's some really awesome work happening by the interplanetary consensus team to actually bring shardable chain space and the ability to create um, subnets where you can transfer state between subnets um, to the Filecoin network and then beyond. And so very exciting work happening there. And those are some of our, our kind of big bets in this area. Um, here is a draft set. This is probably fresh for many folks, but our Q1 um, OKRs or objectives for the year. Um, these are the objectives are things that we hold constant, kind of quarter to quarter, keeping our critical systems running, um, accelerating the teams contributing to the stack, um, scaling data onboarding, and then upgrading Falcoin with those new capabilities. So that maps to our overall strategy. Um, looking at some of the KRs here, um, you know, first, uh, we definitely have an effort um, that we are scaling up around making sure we're better monitoring the functionality of the IPFS network um, with better um, understanding of, um, you know, hey, nodes might be online, but are they serving um, the content and are they offering, say, you know, IPFS powered websites, the sort of performance that are needed to serve their end users effectively. And so um, that is kind of a focus within our overall goal of making sure we maintain good uptime. We want to add that as a uh, requirement to achieving our uptime um, and security uh, goals and and um, and aims. Um, we also we had an OKR last year um, on cutting our infra spend to centralized Web two infra services. We uh, overachieved on that goal. Our goal was thirty percent cut, and we did closer uh, to like forty plus. Um, and so our goal for this quarter is to cut it by fifty percent. Um, we're already about about almost halfway to this goal. I think we're at about twenty percent. Um, cut in our centralized infra spend, which is awesome. And some of our, our work around uh, decentralized gateway, um, we project would would hopefully um, get us the rest of the way. So um, we would still, I think, count this goal achieved, even if we spend the same amount, but we have rerouted it from centralized spend on AWS and Equinix to instead spend to Saturn and all of the Saturn decentralized providers, because that is staying within um, our technologies and ecosystem within Web3, which we think is better. Um, in terms of hyperscaling the talent and teams contributing to the stack, um, there has been awesome work on engaging all sorts of awesome builders in with FEM. And so a uh, goal, I think we're already, we're already on track for this, um, but engaging 2,000 builders through 20 plus events to start building on or with FEM, I think that's pretty, uh, you know, a, a high mark for the FEM team, but I think doable. 
Um, and then also making sure that we're scaling and filling some of the critical open roles um, within teams that are really hitting inflection points um, this quarter and next quarter, and that we're preparing them for the sorts of scale adoption usage and uh, hopefully business success um, that, that they would then have uh, kind of members of their teams to help help with that scale. Um, in terms of scaling data onboarding, um, this is our decentralized gateway goal to have majority. I think the goal that the other team is using is 90%, um, but at least 50% of IPFS gateway traffic being served by Saturn by end of quarter. Um, and then also this is a shared goal here. This 900 petabytes of total data on Filecoin is a shared goal with um, the outer core team that they are also pushing for, um, reaching that by end of quarter. Um, and then we're going to definitely be contributing to the number of successful retrievals. We're at about, you know, we've hit a high of about a hundred of uh, 1 million successful retrievals per week from boost, um, but looking at 2 million successful retrievals per week by the end of the quarter. Um, and then finally, our uh, kind of like core upgrading Filecoin state and data um, and compute. Um, we have our FVM launch, which we are gearing up for um, with over 500 unique contracts deployed on mainnet. Last minute upgrade because we've seen so many unique contracts deployed on hyperspace, the current developer testnet that I think we can hit 500. So I've upped the goals on y'all. Um, and also a, uh, a milestone around interplanetary consensus launching subnets on SpaceNet, which is their ongoing um, IPC testnet. Um, and gaining some, some users actually starting to make use of IPC on SpaceNet to start testing it out. Um, and then finally, for compute over data, um, they're already running active jobs on Buckle Yao, but they aim to reach um, 1,000 jobs per day by the end of the quarter um, with five plus exemplar partners. So we have some good goals. A lot of them are awesome launch related um, that we are going to aim to hit by end of quarter. And we'll let you know how we do. Our roadmap has now moved to star maps. So if you would like to see it and interact with all these different GitHub issues, you can go here um, to see more about it. You can see a number of milestones that have been accomplished over um, kind of like since like end of Q4, beginning of January. Um, I think this one, the uh, Zinnia, Project Zinnia, launching a wallet in Falcon Station landed yesterday, maybe. So update your station nodes if you haven't already. Um, and uh, we have a number of exciting uh, launches that are happening right here in this quarter. I have free IPFS free retrievals from Boost, which is um, happening February 23rd. Um, SPs, like gaining the actual adoption with SPs to, to you know, enable Boost and start offering it by end of March. Um, we have our FVM mainnet launch um, also coming up um, in, you know, um, the very the middle of March. We have our Saturn integration by end of March. We have um, uh, a milestone around Unchained DRAN mainnet. Um, and we have IPC deployed on SpaceNet and a stash station runtime public alpha. Um, and uh, I believe this is a Saturn first CDN customers by end of quarter. So a lot of really exciting milestones that we are, we are launching here. Um, feel free to add more to our star map roadmap um, there as we go. And I'll hand it off to our IPFS folks to tell us more about what's happening there. IPFS, as you know, is um, the peer-to-peer um, gateway to the decentralized web. Uh, it serves content over uh, a network of peers, um, which uh, the content is content uh, is content address, of course, instead of location address, as is the case with current internet technologies. We believe that there is a lot of power um, into into these technologies. So we're doing our best to make it as fast and even faster uh, than current technologies. So a little bit on the KPIs here, um, where we looked into the network size, uh, which has grown, um, if you see the last few bars towards the uh, beginning of this year, uh, we've hit almost 500,000 uh, unique IPFS network nodes in uh, the last week alone. I think that's a little bit less. It's 400, uh, 490 or something. Uh, but we tried to look in the in the context of the first uh, objective that Molly mentioned before. We tried to look into a little bit into the detail of that to figure out how many of those are DHT uh, servers in the network and how many are DHT clients to start getting a little bit more clarity about stability in the network. 
and uh, how nodes are inter interacting with each other. So on the top left, uh, sorry, the top left, we see the bars over, uh, over time. On the top left, sorry, on the top right, we're seeing um, the DHT servers versus clients for the last five weeks. So basically for 2023, uh, we see that, um, of course, there was a dip during the Christmas period uh, where the network size shrinked a little bit. People had other things to do, but then uh, it's picking up again, and we're seeing that um, there is a fair amount of um, of client nodes, which is uh, staying stable over time, uh, Where and then the server nodes are um, have also increased and are keeping stable the last couple of weeks. We're going to still uh, keep on monitoring that, but we're going to start providing other um, other characteristics of the network, such as uh, stability, uptime, uh, how many nodes can actually serve content and be very useful to the network, uh, which kind of leads us to the network performance, the fine latency, uh, which you see on the uh, bottom left. We uh, There is an increase in the latency to find content in the IPFS, um, in the IPFS network through particularly the, the DHT. This is because of several reasons that um, several events and incidents that have happened the last couple of months. Uh, we're looking into that and we I can confirm that um, this latency is going back down this week. Uh, it's not reported here, but we're going to start seeing uh, normal levels of latency. Uh, again, uh, there were several nodes that had misconfigured their uh, their their nodes. Um, some of them due to the resource manager, some of them due to other reasons. And um, after a lot of effort, we've seen that um, yeah, networks are going back to normal thanks to the IPFS team that provided the right recommendations to them. But we're we're going to start providing a little bit more detailed KPIs for the performance there. You can see uh, you can find all this in the page in the document that is linked uh, up there in the title of the graph. Uh, yeah, and finally, in terms of community, uh, we're seeing a, a small uptick in the number of um, users that are getting involved in terms of fears and uh, issues that are being discussed on GitHub and so on. So uh, we hope this is going to keep up and uh, we're doing our best to serve everyone's requests. Thanks, Yanis. Gus, tell us the highlights. Hey, so yeah, we've got a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, improvements on the protocol and implementation side of IPFS. Um, on the cost saving side, we uh, decommissioned the bulk of the work that the Hydras were doing. Um, they're still running, but they're not caching content for the DHT anymore. So we ended up saving around thirty thousand dollars a month from that. Uh, there was a slight latency increase of about thirteen percent. Um, but we're going to keep working to drive that back down. Um, we released Kubo uh, 0 0.18, which is the, the biggest change in, in that is uh, shipping the HTTP delegated routing with SID.contact indexer enabled by default. Um, so now Kubo will be querying both the DHT and SID.contact uh, when it performs its uh, content routing resolution. Um, we... Uh, for, we, we we started shipping golib IPFS. It's still a work in progress, but this is a, a library that contains uh, components for building your own IPFS implementations. Um, we, like we we think that uh, you know most applications should be building their own binaries uh, and not using Kubo because the Kubo is turning into a kitchen sink, and the result of that is it doesn't serve anyone very well. Um, so we're really focusing a lot of our effort now on extracting stuff from Kubo and putting it into libipfs so the, to empower you know the community to to build their own implementations. Um, uh, Helia, which is the uh, a new JavaScript implementation, has its first demo day. Big shout out to Ignite for helping uh, helping us work on the JavaScript Kubo RPC client. Um, and we we did finalize finally the HTTP delegated routing spec. Uh, you can see that in IPIP337. And there's a new Luma group for IPFS events. It's in the link there, Luma slash IPFS. Um, this includes things like the content routing working group, office hours, JSIPFS, compute over data, et cetera. Um, and then coming up this month, uh, there's a new gateway binary we're working on as part of RIA um, called Bifrost Gateway. The link to the repo is there. 
Um, and it's building on top of libIPFS. So we've extracted the gateway code out of Kubo and put it into libIPFS and we're reusing it in this new gateway binary. Awesome, great to see. Over to Russell for Ignite. Great, thanks. So a uh, major update here with uh, regard to um, all of our projects now having telemetry. Um, we, uh, we have metrics for web UI. The Kubo web UI mentioned there is just getting metrics for users rendering web UI from Kubo. <clears throat> so that's coming when uh, 0.19 is released. But a uh, big call out here is that the telemetry has switched to opt out if, um, if it had telemetry previously, but a lot of the projects didn't. So now we have a lot of metrics. As you can see here, we're primarily just trying to get a, a count of users initially, um, but you know our metrics will be opt out going forward. So um, we'll stay away from user identifiable metrics, P2 data, anything like that. Um, but yeah, just a, that's the major call out there. Um, from the data, you can see in this bottom left graph that companion is, you know, dwarfing the rest of our users. So we have a clear picture there that companion needs to be our priority and will be going forward. Um, you know, we'll make sure to focus on improving companion and, and targeting that. Um, the, I've got a link to the dashboard that we have in Notion where I've got some of these charts rendered and then a link to the Google spreadsheet that is public where users can see our um, daily active users, weekly active users, some of these other charts um, where I'm just pulling the last 90 days from Countly and publishing them in Google spreadsheet automatically. And then uh, for star map, uh, we've actually changed the name from starmaps.app to starmap.site. So the link uh, shared earlier um, might redirect you to starmap.site. Don't be afraid. Um, redirect should be working, but let's we'll use uh, starmap.site going forward. There's been some UI updates, uh, significant speed improvement. So on initial render, we're pulling the data from GitHub. So you know it's going to be slow if there's a ton of issues, but on that second render, it should be almost instantaneous. So um, any children issues you've pulled or anything like that will be cached. <clears throat> and it's a stale ride while revalidate caching strategy. So the cache is always up to date uh, with the latest from GitHub. So you might have to refresh twice, but um, the data should always be up to date. Um, and then, yeah, bug fixes. We're working on D3 uh, migration progress, but I'm also, I've also looked into the list view for starmap.site. So let me know if you feel strongly one way or the other. Um, I'm kind of waffling on which to prioritize there, but they're both, you know, coming. Um, and then another call out IPFS companion metrics. We've got user counts here, but we don't really know how many users using companion are, you know, benefiting from companion, how many IPFS URLs are they visiting per day, things like that. So um, we really want to see like whether whether companion is actually useful or if these, you know, 60,000 plus companion users are only using IPFS like 1% of the time. We'd like to get a better picture into that. That's it for us. Awesome. Peter, IPDX. Hi, it's IP Developer Experience Team. We're here to help IP stewards be more effective through tooling and automation. We're currently finishing up Cubo release automation in Cubo Circle CI to GitHub Actions migration projects. We're also in the process of rolling out new unified CI release, which comes with Go 120 upgrade. Finally, we're extremely excited to announce we're starting on the Gateway Conformance Testing Initiative. As for the last month, the main highlight is that we're handing off Test Ground to the Celestia team. Throughout 2022, Test Ground grew immensely. We've engaged with over 50 community members spanning more than seven companies. We accepted many contributions and made the project feel alive again. Now, we're stepping down as the test ground maintainers because IP stewards are currently focused on types of testing which can be achieved more effectively using other means. We still believe in the project and we do expect to be back. When that time comes, we're sure the project will be in an even better place. Celestia has expertise, passion, and resources that will take test ground to the next level. In the meantime, we'll stay involved through monthly test ground implementers sync. See you there. That was 
pretty magical. Um, well done, automating yourselves out of presenting at all hands, IVDX team. Uh, we are impressed and we'll uh, take a note out of out of your book. I, I hear you have many, many potential users for your uh, all hands automation. So uh, great work and keep it up. Over to libp 2 p Hi, this is Marco from libp 2 p the network <laughs> <laughs> The, the networking library for peer-to-peer -peer applications. Uh, okay, so we're continuing to work with like HTTP as the request response uh, protocol for libp2p. If you're interested in using HTTP and get the benefits of libp2p, reach out to us. We're looking for people to work with on this. Um, we shipped interoperability testing, which will test uh, all the different implementations, can communicate with each other over every supported transport, Muxer and security channel. And we're also doing browser testing here. On the community side, we uh, launched or we published our browser to server blog post. And then we did a talk at Boston. On connectivity side, we have shipped and completed the work for web transport in Go and JS. Uh, WebRTC is shipped in JS and Rust. Go is very close. We started a spec for browser to browser, which will let like two browser peers talk to each other. Um, a lot of updates and implementations. Don't have enough time to go into all of them, but definitely check out the links. And that's it. Woohoo! Awesome dashboard of all of your green test results. Winning. Filecoin land. I low-key was stressing out for the past 30 seconds to work on my robot voice, but I failed. But anyhow, hopefully we're not failing beauty Filecoin. <laughs> A decentralized, hopefully being the world's like largest uh, storage network for humanity's information. Uh, so some like stats show it. Uh, so the network total storage capacity, unfortunately, is going down a little bit these days. Uh, we are still super huge though. We are at like 13.81 um, pip for the whole total network like raw capacity. Uh, the, the network uh, storage a decrease is caused by many reasons. The onboarding is going a little bit slower due to the macro economy. And we also have a lot of early days like storage started to expire from the network. However, we're hoping and that with uh, many initiatives coming into the Filecoin, we can reboot the ecosystem more and having more storage onboarded to the network uh, in 2023. However, that being said, uh, more and more uh, storage is being used to store like useful data on the Filecoin network. Uh, that's very exciting. We're at 551 pip uh, for the total uh, raw bytes uh, on the network. And more excitingly, we are actually very stably uh, storing more than two pip per day of data. So, you know, one step closer to our goal um, these days. So that's very good. I have something new for you guys at, um, this time. Uh, so as you have heard, uh, there's a new thing called FEVM that's coming to the Falcon network. And we're enabling user pro programmability on the network and we have this brand new testnet that's developed focus called hyperspace and so far the network is one month old and we are already have like 23,000 of contract deployed and within that we have like 37 hundreds of unique contracts which is very exciting and we are at 17,000 unique ethereum accounts on this network again a one month network, but have 70,000 uh, accounts already. One thing that blows my mind, there's one single contract is triggering like 200,000 invocation. Uh, on, on that con contract. I'm super curious what that contract is about, uh, but that's just something exciting to share. A couple of highlights. When does FBVM launches to the mainnet is the biggest question I have been getting recently. And we finally has a date and it's Happy Pi Day uh, on the March 14th. Uh, we are hoping to launch FBVM uh, into Filecoin mainnet uh, via NV18 Hugo up upgrade. Uh, there are six FIPS that uh, will be included uh, in this network upgrade. It's all FBVM surrounded. And hint, hint, uh, if you don't know that just yet, the chain ID uh, on Ether on Ethereum for the Falcon mainnet is actually 314. I'm not saying we plan this out, but it's, you know, happy Pi Day. Uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, we ship a new developer testnet. Um, there's a, a channel 
uh, in Falcon Slack called Field Hyperspace Discuss. If you want to help us testing and you know, just play around, deploy some application on the network, uh, please do. Uh, for the next, um, the Lotus team, we're also looking at how we should write architecture or improving the Lotus miner uh, to help search provider scale their, uh, their system and working with the Boost team to make sure the whole data onboarding process can be more like robust. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, Lotus Market uh, is now officially end of life as of like January the 31st and Boost is now the go-to market implementation uh, and SP tooling for data onboarding and deal making. Uh, we have uh, seven percent of SPs are running boosts. A lot of most of the deal making SPs are already running boosts, and they're onboarding data using boosts like on daily basis, which is very cool. And there's a new program called Golden Retriever just to help us to make sure that the data being stored on the Filecoin is actually available uh, for for other humans. And Crypto Econ Lab is also proposing a new fit uh, for a uh, call like sector duration multiplier to incentives like longer storage commitment. Uh, not only we want to uh, align in the network mission, uh, even more with the storage provider, but we also want to make sure that the network can support them and thanks for them for their service on the network. And therefore, we are introducing the sector duration multiplier. And the FIP is still in draft. If you have any questions regarding it or any feedbacks, uh, please do head to the FIP discussion uh, and let us know. Woot woot. We now have a couple team updates from FBM, Computer for Data, ProBlab, and Phil Infra. Raul, take it away. Hey, what's up? Hi, everybody. So we launched Hyperspace uh, just last month. Uh, the, you already saw the stats around number of contracts deployed and, and, and sends and so on. It's it's very exciting. This just launched less than less than a month ago. And we three days after we concluded our first upgrade. Uh, this is, by the way, a developer testnet that is not resettable. We're aiming for no resets unless there is a disaster. It's an upgrade only network, and this is really critical for developers because um, if you remember the previous bleed edge network, which was called Wallaby, reset it basically every uh, every week or every two weeks, and this wiped away developer progress. And developers really don't like this. So it's really important uh, to, to have this testnet. This testnet is basically driven by the FEM team. Very excited by that. We have been very hard at work writing FIFs and specifying this massive uh, change that we introduced, uh, that we're introducing to the network. There are five FIPS, all of them have been accepted by now. Uh, if you want to read more about, about how this works internally, uh, there is a new address class. There is the capability to emit actor events now. There's of course an EVM uh, runtime actor. Uh, there is, uh, you can learn everything about how we support Ethereum accounts, addresses and transactions, and how that is in the future going to be evolving to account abstraction. And some, some gas updates uh, have also been introduced. Uh, check out those FIPS. Uh, and as for what's coming next, uh, we are in the final stretch. We're literally, this is week, uh, uh, this is T minus five weeks to mainnet launch. It is, uh, we're preparing the launch sequence here. Uh, it just feels like, you know, those early days of mainnet, mainnet launch as well. It just got like a lot of revival of that. Um, and basically at this stage, we are uh, code freezing the last uh, uh, release uh, prior to the final release. So that is the code freeze release. It's called Carburado 3. It will be released on, on Valentine's Day and hyperspace upgrade will upgrade, sorry, the hyperspace testnet will upgrade to it the next day. And then calibration net will upgrade uh, to that release on February the 21st. Uh, we are projecting Pi Day for, for mainnet as Jennifer already said, and it may have something to do with the chain ID or may not. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a nice buy oriented scheme there. Um, and what I, I thought it would be worth uh, highlighting the massive change in terms of lines of code. This is a uh, network upgrade that involves over 100K net lines of code introduced across uh, Ref FEM, built in actors, and Lotus. So it's a, it's a huge, uh, huge, uh, uh, huge code base uh, change that we're introducing here. It has been audited by two external auditors uh, with that, that, that were very, very useful. Uh, it has been audited by an, an internal red, red team as well. We have launched the uh, bulletproofing initiative, which is a pre-mainnet crowdsourced audit, where we reached out to key uh, individuals, security researchers, uh, other security and, and audit firms that didn't actually 
uh, make it into kind of like his main auditors. And these have been going through through the code base. Uh, there are rewards here, and they've been filing filing some issues which uh, are are interesting. And definitely, some of them have come across uh, real issues that we managed to fix. So that that was a great initiative. We're also working on ecosystem preparations. Uh, I like to describe this launch as not the FEM launch. We're not just launching the technology to the network. We're actually introducing programmability as an entire new capability to the network. And we only do this once. So really, there are going to be more FEM upgrades and there's going to be a native development environment with runtime and so on. But these are incremental, incremental improvements over this capability that we only get to introduce once. So really key here is making sure that the ecosystem of existing partners, tools, and applications and products that are running on Filecoin are well adapted, are, um, are do not break, of course, but also are prepared for a programmable world. And this entails exposing not just pretty application front front ends and so on, but also making the functionality available through APIs and potentially adding oracles on chain that can such that smart contracts can access their 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 data and so on and their features, right? So we're working with things like minor reputation services. We're working with wallets, fill plus tools. Uh, we're also looking at adding oracles, bridges, DeFi tools, and so on. So there's a lot of work going there. There's also a hackathon that we that is that literally ends whose finale is tomorrow. Uh, Sarah is going to talk more about that uh, in in the in the next slides, uh, I think. So I won't I won't cover it much. And yeah, that's uh, and then bulletproofing, which I already went through. So yeah, that's pretty much pretty much it. Sorry for more than one minute for sure. <laughs> it's exciting stuff. We're all very pumped for FBM. So. Um... Yeah, we'll we'll get a, a deep dive from or a spotlight from Sarah in a moment about what you can do next. Compute over data. Hey everyone, um, I'll try and keep it uh, uh, short, um, but that that FEM stuff is fantastic. Um, uh, since last we spoke, we had our COD summit. Uh, over eight hundred attendees, two hundred in person, eight hundred uh, six hundred live stream. Uh, we launched to beta on stage in November. And since then, we have seen a huge uptick in the number of jobs, uh, people out there actually in the public um, executing jobs on network. Um, super awesome. Um, uh, you know, we have over 100,000 in aggregate jobs on the public network, uh, and we're at 30,000 jobs a month. So we're, we're quite excited. Um, we've released a whole bunch of new uh, technology, including UCAN support. Uh, we support external networking, for example, for pulling in packages and other things while you're compiling. Uh, private cluster support, uh, our Python SDK. And uh, just this week, we were able to launch a streaming prototype that included uh, eventing and live camera capture uh, through back to jobs, which we're really excited. Um, one thing that we did want to highlight here, you can see on the right, a double, unic double horned unicorn, uh, uh, violating the name, uh, generated by stable diffusion. That is the first object generated via a uh, smart contract at the EVM contract, pushing through to back the out and coming back with a result. So there you go. First artifact in the world. Um, we will have, uh, 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 we have another code name, unfortunately named uh, Project Lily Pad, not associated with Lily, um, coming later this month, uh, which will uh, allow website and allow anyone to pay for, fill, uh, for uh, jobs, uh, including NFTs. There you go. Um, uh, executed uh, via contracts uh, through. Um, we also have uh, an on prem contract. Uh, to allow people to, to do it using uh, IPFS cluster and uh, other on-prem services. Uh, Project Amplify, which will automatically wrap and uh, augment existing data on uh, Filecoin. Um, and then uh, lots more you can see there. I'll try to keep it short. Um, so that's what you see there. Um, uh, that's uh, all of computer over data. Pretty darn cool. I like your double unicorn and very excited to see Bako Yao coming to FVM. That is, you know, hey, things are, are reinforcing and uh, pushing each other forward. Uh, on to Marcus for Phil Infra. Okay, so we launched a new Lotus Lightweight Snapshot service uh, at the end of the last quarter. Um, we have been receiving up to 50,000 mainnet snapshot downloads per, per week, and we also now provide some snapshots on the calibration network. Um, we've also introduced compressed snapshots for faster down, download times. One of the challenges with, with snapshots is they continue to grow, so uh, by having a, a compressed snapshot, that should make uh, life a bit easier. And we 
cut costs by moving from S3 to R2 for storing the uh, snapshots at the moment. Um, we also have some updates on the Lotus Gateway side. We launched a uh, a website called chain.love that has Lotus Light docs, a, a interactive explorer and more. So it's all backed by um, by our, our gateway, which is a api.chain.love. You should check it out. There's pretty cool stuff there. Um, and just in general, a, a update on our gateway. Uh, we had 99.88% uptime over the last year. So close to, to three nines. Um, and we service 20 million queries per, per week. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a lot of nodes that don't need to sync the, sync the chain and they can uh, leverage our, our Lotus gateway. Um, and the last update is, is now also uh, a, a load balance service across the Americas, Europe and Asia, where it was uh, it was a, uh, a, a, a American only um, deployment before. So you should have some better performance from Europe and Asia now. Um, our future opportunities, um, we're going to be supporting the next upgrade. It's uh, critical that we're on top of that and we uh, help the Lotus Dev team as well as keep our core network infrastructure running smoothly during that upgrade. Um, we, we, all, we have an opportunity for um, anyone that is interested in running bootstrap nodes. Um, please reach out to the Phil Philander team and we'd be uh, glad to help you work through that process. And we're always uh, hoping to de decentralize our core network in infrastructure. So reach out if you have interest. Thank you. Awesome. And our last team update from ProBlab. Hello again. Um, so uh, lots of news from ProBlab. Uh, we're pushing forward with all things measurements. Uh, very important to know what's going on in the network, as uh, mentioned several uh, times already. And we're really glad that uh, people are uh, reaching out to us to ask for more of these. So um, although we don't have capacity to uh, serve all of the requests, we're definitely uh, having keeping a backlog of all those. Uh, we've recently transitioned from uh, the NetOps team, which was the suborg that we were we're uh, part of two IP stewards, and that's because we want to, um, it makes sense to work closer with um, the IP stewards team, and not only do measurements, but also land optimizations upon the um, uh, measurement studies are done. Uh, we have, uh, we've done the natural punching measurement campaign in December, and a uh, big thank you to everyone that participated. Dennis is going to give um, a deep dive in a few minutes from now. Um, we've uh, we've led the Hydra dial, dial down events um, when we figured out that um, the performance boost that we were getting from Hydras is not as great as anticipated. So we ran experiments and did some uh, pretty graphs to show what's going on. We're still monitoring um, the impact that the Hydra dial, dial down events um, uh, resulted to. Um, and we've shipped alongside the hydro dial down uh, report seven other technical reports uh, with lots of nice graphs, such as the ones that you see on the right hand side. Uh, pretty technical, pretty detailed, not really the kind of 30 second elevator blog post read that um, you would do. So if you're in, into that sort of thing, uh, head there. Um, yeah, and we, we've, uh, we're working on a spec for uh, reader privacy in uh, IBFS and lib 2 So this is super, super exciting. There has been lots of work to even write the spec. I know it's going to be used by several uh, teams in the uh, in the PL network and in our stack. So the, uh, the spec is still being uh, put together. So if you want to contribute, go to that pull request shown there. Um, yeah, so in terms of opportunities, we're posting weekly reports on the state of the IPFS network at stats.ipfs.network, and we want to enhance what we what you'll see there with a lot more. Um, that is, um, yeah, part of our milestones for 2023. Thunderdome is going to be used uh, as a pre-release tester for um, for Kubo among other things, which is uh, really great, a uh, great tool to put into good use. Um, yeah, and finally, not very future opportunity, um, past opportunity. IPFS CAM seems, um, seems to be ages ago, but we've got lots of the recordings um, of, of the things that we've been working on. So uh, make sure to have uh, to, to, to watch those for all of the updates, at least up until a couple of months ago. 
Uh, yeah, we're in Slack and IPFS Discord, Proud-Lab. Uh, we've got a Notion page with a project board on all of our projects and the GitHub repository there where this discussion is happening. Thanks, Thank Giannis. We got a lightning speed through our spotlight, starting with Space Warp. Okay, um, challenge accepted. So um, for FEM, talking about Space Warp and how you can get ready for it, if you haven't heard Space Warp, it's the launch program that we're running with Ecosystem. Um, TLDR, we had a huge hackathon that just ended. The finale is this Friday. If you want to tune in and see what teams have made it to the finals and what people are building, you can do so at the link here. Um, great porting function. We've had a lot of great content. We've both demos and solutions come out from the hackathon itself. You can click on all those things to check it out. Um, I will call out the huge um, piece and thank you for all the teams at Andrew here who have like, participated, Bakial, Medusa, um, Estuary as well, working together with us to get um, demos out and integrations out and being allowing hackers to test those. Um, also realizing that deal making context is a huge um, piece of the developer experience for them to understand. So we're going to work a lot more on that documentation moving forward. Um, the other piece here is that if you want to collaborate with FEVM, um, we have the early builder demo days, uh, demo showcases that are running all the way to launch. Um, if you want to participate, you can DM me to join the FEM Foundry F1 channel to get um, what the agenda is. And so when you participate in there, you can also project, you can share your project or you can have um, your the demos that you're working on shared with other hackers there to test it out. Um, so a lot of building, uh, building going on right now. Um, if you want to participate in that and get your project tested, go to the link over here. Um, this will be an internal resource page for um, folks over here. As much as possible, we hope that you ask questions in Phil Builders openly. And then if you have any internal questions that you're not sure about, um, you can ask in the FPM EMA internal channel, which is private, and you can also ping me to join it. Um, but yeah, 30 seconds. Woohoo! Tune in tomorrow. On to Birdie. Hey, this is Brady from Sentinel team. Uh, we want to share a service we created to generate a daily archive of great snapshot for the Filecoin minute. Uh, chain of since Genesis. So we currently have 900 snapshots, totally of uh, 30 terabyte of data. So what are archival kind of great snapshots? Uh, they include state rule messages received for the 2880 epochs that they cover. Uh, why are they important? First, uh, they allow initialization of Lotus or Filecoin clients on any specific day. Second, our team use those snapshots to extract and index the full chain data. We are currently at 90% uh, completeness of uh, uh, the data processing, and we made it queryable in, in BigQuery. Uh, we are starting to onboard people uh, both internally and externally. Uh, for some high-priced tables, we do have full data. For example, we provide via messages and uh, gas output to Cryptio uh, for them to help um, uh, the auditing work uh, for our storage providers. Um, third, um, those snapshots serve as a full chain history backup beside the existing full archive nodes. Uh, it's possible to reconstruct the full node for those snapshots. And that is uh, the possibility of storing the full Filecoin chain on Filecoin IPFS is greatly simplified. We already have uh, our POM partners showing um, interest in working on this. We can share more in the future. Thank you. Woohoo! Great progress. Station. Hello. Station is the your gateway to the Filecoin economy is now shipping with an inbuilt wallet. Uh, before you had to put in a, a fill address from an external wallet, but now the onboarding is super slick and it just sets one up for you automatically. Uh, the way you can use it, you just go in and you, you get your station address. And as you earn fill for uh, completing jobs uh, and earning from the Filecoin economy, uh, it starts to tally up and your total goes up. And we want to treat it as sort of a hot wallet. So every so often you'll transfer that fill out to a more secure or permanent wallet. And you can see on this wallet page, you've got a list of previous transactions coming in, and we're leaning on the Glyph APIs here. Uh, if you want to find out more, head to fillstation.app to download. And uh, shouts out to Julian Gruber, who's who's led on this initiative, and Miro as well. NB, uh, there are no modules yet which are actually going to be paying out fill, but there are a lot of module builders who are really interested in building these modules and having a peer-to-peer -peer network set up from people's home devices. Uh, we've, we've just kicked off a, kicked off a working group uh, with a Slack channel. So if you would like to get involved, please get in touch with us uh, and join the, the working group to create all these modules, which are going to start participating to, in various different ways to the Falcon economy. Awesome. Thanks. Deal client contracts, Shanuj. Hello. So with FPM coming online, we decided to build some generic client contracts, which would serve as a template for a lot of the use cases we want to see built on Filecoin. Examples of such are data DAOs, perpetual storage, storage automation, 
We also developed tooling on the SP to claim bounties and enhance the deal-making protocol to initiate deals with contracts, which will make deal-making more programmatic. I want to thank you thank you to, the Anton, to Anton and the Boost team who are working to basically build a solution in a more productionized manner and bring it to SPs. Uh, some of the positive things to come out of this work, we highlighted a lot of the gaps we had in the protocol and drove some protocol refinements. Uh, and also in tooling, which we have available today, both on the dev and the SP side. We've also seen several devs use these contracts as templates to build their own functionality uh, as part of Hack FevM and the Space Warp Hackathon. So that's been very encouraging to see. Uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about this, we have created multiple tutorials with several links to documentation and hope to create more. Uh, you can find us at the uh, where to find us box. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to Zen Ground Zero for initiating this project. Uh, Irene and Luca from the CryptoNet team who've been engaging in protocol research for this and Jennifer for holding the project together. Uh, as for what's next, we want to use these building blocks to store Filecoin on Filecoin, which hopefully serves as a strong demonstration for what can be built on our network. Epic. Cool. We are on to our deep dives. Let's start with NetOps. So uh, this is a um, deep dive about the infrared cost op optimizations that we've been doing. Uh, our goals are to reduce infrastructure spend across all of uh, protocol labs, uh, clarify the cost per team by uh, deprecating shared accounts and, and establishing a regular cost reporting, um, ensure maximum efficiency through right sizing and removing unused infra, establishing cost baselines and providing best practices and tooling to keep costs low. Moving forward, um, we established a uh, working group um, that meets weekly, and they've been working very hard for months now to cut costs. Um, on the AWS side, uh, we've cut costs by 60%, Equinot, uh, on Equinix by 22%. Um, some of the highlights, uh, we, we've been deprecating a really old account uh, called the Filecoin staging account. It's existed for over five, five years and is, was kind of a catch-all for everything to do with Filecoin. Um, I'm not sure if, if anyone even knows what Go Filecoin is, but we found a couple nodes that were still running from there, so, right? So that's, that's pretty old school. Um, so we, we established a uh, migration plan for any services that are production services that, that are running there, and then we uh, got rid of all the uh, known un unused infra, and then we enforced a tagging schema and performed a screen test that really got rid of all the orphaned and un unclaimed in infrastructure that had some really good good results. So thanks to all that that helped with that. Um, on the on the Equinix side, the, the focus was on the gateways. Uh, there was actually some bandwidth op optimizations that are good to share with with the whole network. Uh, the migration to Kubo uh, and to the uh, resource manager had significant savings on our, our egress costs, and then we moved uh, some of the infra to to uh, to a uh, reservation. So um, the the last bit I wanted to, to share was just the, the adoption of Cloud Custodian. It's a Python based tool uh, that was really helpful for all of this. Um, it helps with with uh, reporting, enforcing tags, and we're able to schedule our our entire screen test with this tool. So for any team that's looking Looking to cut their cloud costs, uh, I would really suggest that tool. So the next steps, um, we now reached a, a, a baseline, I think, where uh, the costs are clear for uh, each team. So, um, so some some of the next steps now, now that we have that data is to establish long-term savings plans, um, and we're looking to to establish best practices to keep our costs down term basis, um, and finally, to provide best practices and tooling to keep uh, the cost low for other companies in uh, the, the uh, P PLN as well. I think it's really important that we uh, help the whole ecosystem uh, cut costs and uh, do as, as much as possible to share this work that, that we're doing. So thanks to all of those that helped out, and also thanks to the uh, working core, the, the, the working group uh, core, because yeah, that, that's been a lot of effort, and we uh, hope to continue to. Epic, um, huge, huge work here, big, big thanks to everyone. And really this goes into like, you know, everything that we're saving in our infra cost optimizations is more uh, funds we get to put back into all of the work that we're doing elsewhere, which is, all the better. So thank you, Marcus and others so much for all that hard work. Um, over to Dennis for our nat hole punching results. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Dennis from Probe Lab. I tried to speed run my, uh, my tiny presentation. So I um, we as Probe Lab were running the nat hole punching month. So, so first of all, thanks to everyone who participated. 
So what were the project's goals? Um, so network punching in general, we want to have full connectivity among all nodes of a lib P2P network, despite nets and firewalls. And um, in general, this specific project, because we wanted to gather information that guide um, protocol optimizations or also some implementation details. And we got a lot of data uh, for that. The measurement campaign ran from the 1st of December until officially until the 1st of January this year. Um, uh, I analyzed the data that we gathered until the 10th of uh, January, so a little more. We had uh, almost 300 API keys generated that could, in theory, have um, uh, submitted data. Uh, but after some deed application and so on, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, so with this 154 clients, so we had 154 clients deployed that have hole punched or punched 47,000 peers around the world and contributed uh, 6.25 million uh, data points that we are now uh, analyzing or I have started analyzing. And the, on the right hand side, you can see where the clients were deployed and uh, sorry, and the, the remote remote peers resided. So we basically probed the whole network, uh, so the whole world. As, so here we have the, the time on the x-axis, on the, on the left y-axis, the success rate, and each dot is an individual, um, so the color of each dot is an individual network in which the client was deployed. And um, so basically what you can see here is that the success rate, if we probe the whole wor world or the, all the other peers in the network, we have a whole punching success rate of around 70%. And... So, so I, I will get to this in a bit, um, but yeah, so this highly depends on on the on the network conditions. Um, but yeah, so we have around seventy percent, and the faint red line in the background is the number of um, data points that were submitted on each day across all the clients that we have de um, deployed, which um, at peak were thirty five thousand, and uh, yeah, dropped after I have sent out the email that the whole punching campaign is done. So what were the insights so far? So I'm still uh, um, working on the final report. So the success rate is around 70%, but as I said, um, since we're probing the whole world, it depends on the uh, on, on the network of, of clients as well. However, that's the success rate that a peer would experience right now if they used the whole project protocol today um, to connect to a random peer, other peer in the network. Um, then some other insights. Uh, we expected Quick to be more successful than TCP. We couldn't verify this, so it seems to be that they are similarly successful uh, with uh, with regards to hole punching. Uh, IPv4, IPv6, IPv6 has a much lower success rate. Um, not, we're still not sure if this is in a measurement detail or actually a, a problem in the implementation or the protocol. Um, interestingly, it's not round trip time dependent. So if you know the uh, the whole punching protocol a little bit better, it's um, we're synchronizing both peers, and we thought that the round trip time um, is is a big factor into uh, plays a big role in the in the success rate, which we couldn't verify. So that's also good that we know that we're not aiming to optimize the, for that. Then peers, as expected, have a less uh, a worse success rate in VPNs, but also we have interest um, in, in another protocol optimization for that uh, lined up. And um, so, so I, this graph at the bottom is quite um, quite insightful. So we try the whole punch three times. But I, we found out that if a whole punch was successful, it was with 97.6% successful with the first attempt, with the first try. This means let's optimize the protocol to change strategy with the second or third attempt to increase the odds with the second and third attempt. So this is also in, another insight for that. I listed the, the three, like there's an, another protocol improvement that, we, that we're proposing based on feedback from the FOSDEM talk that we Max and I gave in, in Brussels last weekend. Um, also um, some implementation details, issues kind of things. So still discussing discussions going on. Um, around some 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 weird data points that we have which could indicate some bugs or not so we're still discussing that and in terms of next step i'm working on the final report you can see the uh, the gif at the bottom right um i'm already started with that there are many more graphs and so on many uh, things to to look into and a lot of angles to look um into the data and yeah feel free to have a read and this is the next step thanks a lot Awesome. Thank you so much. We got lots of really great data. We have some awesome cost optimizations for infra. We have FVM hackathon um, closing out tomorrow. You should go to that, that demo. And we have a great set of launches coming for end of quarter. So big, big thank you to everyone for an awesome all hands and uh, an awesome beginning to the to Q1 and excited to, to see the progress when we get together next.
Um, and thanks y'all for staying late and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day.